One month after the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, the first shots of the American Civil War were fired here at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, on April 12, 1861. Certainly slavery was a cause for the Civil War, but not the primary cause. Lincoln knew that the economy of the South depended upon slavery, and so before the Civil War, he had no intention of eliminating it. Lincoln had put it this way in his inaugural address only one month earlier. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it now exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Even after the first shots were fired here at Fort Sumter, Lincoln continued to insist that the Civil War was not about the issue of slavery. My paramount objective is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. So what was the Civil War all about? There were many factors at play. The money changers were still stung by America's withdrawal from their control 25 years earlier. Since then, America's wildcat economy had made the nation rich, a bad example for the rest of the world. The central bankers now saw an opportunity to split the rich new nation, to divide and conquer by war. Was this just some sort of wild conspiracy theory at the time? Well, let's take a look at what a well-placed observer of the scene had to say at the time. His name was Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of Germany, the man who united the German states a few years later. The division of the United States into federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the United States, if they remained as one bloc and as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence which would upset their financial domination over the world. Within months after the first shots here at Fort Sumter, the central bankers loaned Napoleon III of France, the nephew of the Waterloo Napoleon, 210 million francs to seize Mexico and station troops along the southern border of the U.S., taking advantage of their war to violate the Monroe Doctrine and return Mexico to colonial rule. No matter what the outcome of the Civil War, a weakened America, heavily indebted to the money changers, would open up Central and South America once again to European colonization and domination the very thing America's Monroe Doctrine had forbade in 1823. At the same time, Great Britain moved 11,000 troops into Canada and positioned them menacingly along America's northern border. The British fleet went to war alert should their quick intervention be called for. Lincoln knew he was in a double bind. That's why he agonized over the fate of the Union. There was a lot more to it than just differences between the North and the South. That's why his emphasis was always on union and not merely the defeat of the South. But Lincoln needed money to win. In 1861, Lincoln and his Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, went to New York to apply for the necessary loans. The money changers, anxious to see the union fail, offered loans at 24 to 36 percent interest. Lincoln said thanks, but no thanks, and returned to Washington. Lincoln sent for an old friend, Colonel Dick Taylor of Chicago, and put him on the problem of financing the war. During one meeting, Lincoln asked Taylor what he discovered. Taylor put it this way. Why, Lincoln, that is easy. Just get Congress to pass a bill authorizing the printing of full legal tender treasury notes and pay your soldiers with them, and go ahead and win your war with them also. When Lincoln asked if the people of the United States would accept the notes, Taylor said, The people, or anyone else, will not have any choice in the matter if you make them full legal tender. 
they will have the full sanction of the government and be just as good as any money as Congress is given that express right by the Constitution. So that's exactly what Lincoln did. In 1862-63, he printed up $450 million worth of the new bills. In order to distinguish them from other banknotes in circulation, he printed them in green ink on the back side. That's why the notes were called greenbacks. With this new money, Lincoln paid the troops and bought their supplies. During the course of the war, nearly $450 million worth of greenbacks were printed at no interest to the federal government. Lincoln understood who was really pulling the strings and what was at stake for the American people. This is how he explained his rationale. The government should create, issue, and circulate all the currency and credit needed to satisfy the spending power of the government and the buying power of consumers. The privilege of creating and issuing money is not only the supreme prerogative of government, but it is the government's greatest creative opportunity. By the adoption of these principles, money will cease to be master and become the servant of humanity. A truly incredible editorial in the London Times explained the central banker's attitude towards Lincoln's greenbacks. If this mischievous financial policy, which has its origins in North America, shall become indurated down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money without cost. It will pay off debts and be without debt. It will have all the money necessary to carry on its commerce. It will become prosperous without precedent in the history of the world. The brains and wealth of all countries will go to North America. That country must be destroyed or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe. The scheme was effective. So effective that the next year, 1863, with federal and Confederate troops beginning to mass for the decisive battle of the Civil War, and the Treasury in need of further congressional authority to issue more greenbacks, Lincoln allowed the bankers to push through the National Bank Act. These new national banks would operate under a virtual tax-free status and collectively had the exclusive monopoly power to create the new form of money, banknotes. Though greenbacks continued to circulate, their numbers were not increased. But most importantly, from this point on, the entire U.S. money supply would be created out of debt by bankers buying U.S. government bonds and issuing them for reserves for banknotes. As historian John Kenneth Galbraith explained it. In numerous years following the war, the federal government ran a heavy surplus. It could not, however, pay off its debt, retire its securities, because to do so meant there would be no bonds to back the national banknotes. To pay off the debt was to destroy the money supply. Later in 1863, Lincoln got some unexpected help from Tsar Alexander II of Russia. The Tsar, like Bismarck in Germany, knew what the international money changers were up to and had steadfastly refused to let them set up a central bank in Russia. If America survived and was able to remain out of their clutches, the Tsar's position would remain secure. If the bankers were successful at dividing America and giving the pieces back to Great Britain and France, both nations under control of their central banks, eventually they would threaten Russia again. So the Tsar gave orders that if either England or France actively intervened and gave aid to the South, Russia would consider such action as a declaration of war. He did the same with part of his Pacific fleet and sent them to port in San Francisco. Lincoln was re-elected the next year, 1864. Had he lived, he would surely have killed the National Bank's money monopoly extracted from him during the war. On November 21, 1864, he wrote a friend the following. The money power preys upon the nation in times of peace and conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. Shortly before Lincoln was murdered, 
His former Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, bemoaned his role in helping secure the passage of the National Banking Act only one year earlier. My agency in promoting the passage of the National Banking Act was the greatest financial mistake in my life. It has built up a monopoly which affects every interest in the country. On April 14, 1865, 41 days after his second inauguration and just five days after Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. Bismarck, Chancellor of Germany, lamented the death of Abraham Lincoln. The death of Lincoln was Bismarck a disaster well for Christendom. The money changers plan. There was no man Allegations in the United States great enough to wear his for Lincoln's assassination. I fear that foreign in bankers Canada with their craftiness later, and tortuous tricks will entirely control Gerald the exuberant G. riches McGeer, of America a popular and, and well use it systematically to corrupt modern civilization. The they will not hesitate to plunge the, the whole House of Christendom Commons, into word and chaos money in order that the earth should become Remember, their inheritance. Remember, it was 1934, the height of the Great Depression, which was ravaging Canada as well. McGeer had obtained evidence deleted from the public record provided to him by Secret Service agents at the trial of John Wilkes Booth after Booth's death. McGeer said it showed that Booth was a mercenary working for the international bankers. According to an article in the Vancouver Sun of May 2nd, 1934, Abraham Lincoln, the martyred emancipator of the slaves, was assassinated through the machinations of a group representative of the international bankers who feared the United States president's national credit ambitions. There was only one group in the world at that time who had any reason to desire the death of Lincoln. They were the men opposed to his national currency program and who had fought him throughout the whole Civil War on his policy of greenback currency. Interestingly, McGeer claimed that Lincoln was assassinated not only because international bankers wanted to reestablish a central bank in America, but because they also wanted to base America's currency on gold, gold they controlled. In other words, put America on a gold standard. Lincoln had done just the opposite by issuing U.S. notes, greenbacks, which were based purely on the good faith and credit of the United States. The article quoted McGeer as saying, They were the men interested in the establishment of the gold standard and the right of the bankers to manage the currency and credit of every nation in the world. With Lincoln out of the way, they were able to proceed with that plan and did proceed with it in the United States. Within eight years after Lincoln's assassination, silver was demonetized and the gold standard money system set up in the United States. Not since Lincoln has the U.S. issued debt-free United States notes. These red-sealed bills, which were issued in 1963, were not a new issue from President Kennedy, but merely the old greenbacks reissued year after year. In another act of folly and ignorance, the 1994 Regal Act actually authorized the replacement of Lincoln's greenbacks with debt-based notes. In other words, greenbacks were in circulation in the United States until 1994. Why was silver bad for the bankers and gold good? Simple, because silver was plentiful in the United States. It was very hard to control. Gold was, and always has been, scarce. Throughout history, it has been relatively easy to monopolize gold, but silver has historically been 15 times more plentiful. Now, Abraham Lincoln funded the Civil War and government without taxation and without borrowing. It really happened, but we don't learn about it in school. We don't learn about it in textbooks, and the media doesn't tell us. The power of government, the power to create money is 
the power to govern. When the government loses its power to create money, it is no longer the government. 